You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Great War interview. Today, I'm joined by Sam Hume, PhD student at the University of Aberdeen, and the creator of the Pax Britannica podcast, which is an excellent podcast that you should be listening to. So Sam, how's it going today? It's, it's going great. It's going even better now after, after that intro. <laughs> I, I will just tell you, Pax Britannica, you know, I don't know, I'm subscribed to several podcasts, and there's like a tier list of podcasts. There's like, hey, I need to listen to this on the week of release. Hey, I'm going to let this pile up a little bit and... I wish I had time to listen to this are kind of my three tiers. Your podcast is in the top tier. It does usually get listened to on the week of release. So that is lovely to hear. I mean, same same for history of the Second World War. I binge that, as you know, I'm a I'm a supporter on Patreon, so I get the full thing and I listen to it every day as soon as it comes out. We're just we're just bigging bigging each other up here, aren't we? We're just having a good yeah, chat. we really are. We really are. <laughs> this is this is a very encouraging conversation. I wish every conversation was like this. <laughs> so we're not here to talk about Pax Britannica or podcasting, um, or I guess maybe Pax Britannica will get here eventually. Don't eventually. know when that's going to end in, in a decade or whenever that is. Um, we are here to talk about the the topic for your PhD research, which is uh, kind of around the the British Commonwealth, Dominion, Colonies, uh, however you're going to look at them. Which I think leads me into my first question. Dominions, Commonwealth, colonies, places around the world. What am I supposed to actually call these geographic areas that we're here to talk about today? (laughs) Um, Well, so in 1914, the British Empire has a vast variety of different protectorates, territories, outposts, trade posts. My focus, my research is focused on the self-governing colonies, which in 1907 get the title of dominions. Now, these are, these are self-governing colonies that have a certain level of development, they have a certain level of uh, political self-governance and trust, and these are the bodies that were invited to the earlier colonial conferences during Queen Victoria's reign, and they've, they've kept on turning up. This isn't all of them. Not all self-governing colonies get this. It's a very exclusive club. By 1914, that club consists of Canada, Newfoundland, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. And these are all termed dominions, named after the Dominion of Canada, which is the official formal title for, for that country. Now, the exact relationship between Great Britain and the dominions is very vague, very abstract. It doesn't really get tied down, or written down at least, until. The, the First World War, essentially, and, and it develops from there. And it's this battle, almost, between competing desires for further cooperation between the Dominions themselves and between the Dominions and Britain, and autonomy, self-control, being able to be champions of their own destiny, while also keeping that British connection alive. And it's this push and pull throughout the opening decades of the 20th century. The term Commonwealth is, or British Commonwealth, as it, as it comes to be known, is, is the term for the group of these dominions. So it's the dominions plus the United Kingdom, not everyone else. Although contemporaries do start to conflate empire and commonwealth together, that's a whole different thing. But I specifically look at the British Commonwealth of Nations, which is UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa and Newfoundland. I always forget about Newfoundland. Everyone always does. The term the Commonwealth actually was popularised during the First World War. Um, A a political treatise came out in 1916 called The Problem of the Commonwealth. And the problem 
as this author saw it, was that the Commonwealth needed a unified vision, a unified voice in foreign policy. The dominions were independent in every other way, every internal way. They set their own taxes, their own laws. Westminster could interfere, but generally didn't. But when it came to issues of war and peace, like 1914 showed, they didn't really get a say. And so the solution, this author wrote at least, was a unified imperial federation of a shared parliament with a shared electorate and a shared government. Now that doesn't really get off the ground. That This is actually the final few years of the imperial federation movement, but the term commonwealth, that gets popularized. And then in 1917, we get it formally used for the first time, an imperial commonwealth. And in the Anglo-Irish Treaty, the term the British Commonwealth of Nations is used for the first time. So, so you mentioned there's kind of this like push and pull around autonomy and, and, and how exactly this whole structure works. This is kind of tainted a little bit by my, by my current podcast, but during this era, is there any kind of sort of friction generated by the fact that the, the British are controlling stuff, as you mentioned, um, but then also they are kind of on the hook for a lot of the military protection of, of, of all of these overseas colonies. Is there any kind of the same kind of friction that we see in the interwar years? Is that also happening before the First World War around who is responsible financially for the defense of empire? Oh, it absolutely is. And that's one of the, one of the issues which the problem of the Commonwealth highlights, and, it, and it's not unique in pointing that out. This is, for example, the perspective of Wilfrid Laurier, who at an earlier, I think, yeah, the 1911 Im- Imperial Conference, when one Dominion representative, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, was pushing for something like Imperial Federation, Laurier was very much opposed to this. He took the position that well, we don't want to pay for, a, for an army, we don't want to pay for a navy. If we don't have a say in Britain's foreign policy, we're not responsible for Britain's foreign policy. And that didn't quite stand up to the test of time, as 1914 would show, but he wasn't in power by that point. There was definitely this idea that the Dominions should pay their fair share. And there was this idea that the dominions and the empire as a whole was a drain on Britain in terms of defense, because the the dominions weren't paying their fair share. And it's all stacked up with with graphs and statistics. And yes, in in terms of per capita, the dominions were being subsidized, basically, by Britain. But the reverse argument with that was that, well, the uh, the dominions don't get a say in when to go to war, why should they have to pay? For their own defence, if they don't get a say in when they have to defend themselves, and it was this, it was a debate that was quite vital and quite passionate, and it's one of the reasons I find the, the period so interesting. Uh, and and I'm sure the leaders in London were uh, very reluctant to give up any of the control that they had about you know when they were going to war or about foreign relations. Oh, absolutely! At the the 1911 Imperial Conference when. Joseph Ward, who's the, the New Zealand Prime Minister I mentioned, he's pushing for this. He's not doing a very good job of making his point clear, and basically everyone gangs up on him. But Asquith, who's the Prime Minister at the time and, and would be, as your listeners know, at the start of the First World War, he's very clear. He, he says there's no way that we can, we can share responsibility for foreign policy. He cites practical issues, like war can come over the course of a matter of days. There could be a crisis. We can't wait for five Dominion governments to get a telegram, convene their cabinets, convene parliaments, discuss it, get back to us, we all discuss all that. It, it would drag the whole process out. It's not feasible. But there was, of, there was also more constitutional questions to do with that. He implies that questioning that status could affect the whole structure of the empire as a whole. And he basically says, no, there's no way we can, we can share this responsibility. It has to stay with London. And mostly everyone's like, okay, that makes sense. Fair enough. But it's not necessarily the same as saying that the Dominions had no voice at all. Especially with, with 1914, I think the, the case that the Dominions were dragged in on, without any consultation is true in a legalistic way. They were not consulted. But that's not to say they didn't consent. A lot of the Dominions, especially New Zealand and Australia, during the July crisis, they're sending telegrams to London saying, we'll be there if you need us. 
Well, here's an, we promise armies, we promise ships, we promise men, we promise money and goods. And the idea that there would be a European war in the near future was not, it didn't come out of the blue. People were suspecting it. There was the naval arms race with Germany. There was up until, I mean, for a long time, Russia was the great enemy as well. Like there's the idea that everyone almost knew that there would be a war eventually. And the dominions were not unwilling members of it, as we can see when the war actually breaks out, and a lot of them rally to the colours and show the, the show Britain that they are still part of the same family. Um, so yeah, moving into the war years, you know, the contribution uh, of the Dominions to the British war effort is, is very well documented and is very important to, to the overall war effort. You know, you, you get places like some, some of the most famous kind of areas of, of the First World War, at least from my perspective, stuff like Gallipoli, Vimy Ridge, very important to Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. But then other theaters like Africa, the Middle East, and, and you know, so on and so forth. Sort of when the war starts, you mentioned that, you know, some places were very kind of ready to go, very much throwing their support behind decisions made in London. But was there kind of a difference in experience of, among these places when it came to the war? Like, were there different views on the war depending on where they were located on the globe or different responses to the sort of uh, the conflict when it starts? When it starts and among the Dominions, not so much. There's dissidents against the war, like there were in all the belligerent countries, especially left wing parties were, a lot of them were very eager to reject the war, go for international peace and all that stuff. And that doesn't really work out, but there are dissidents who, who think that. But in terms of official like Dominion government positions, not really. They all rally to the flag. They even, even South Africa, which within 12 years or so has been at war with Britain um, and only became a, a, a united country four years prior. But even, even they rally to the flag. Now, South Africa is a different story, kind of, because there is a small rebellion, which in hindsight is not a real threat. But this was the Maritz Rebellion that came out of lingering anti-British resentment and also pro-German sympathies, but it's, it's crushed very quickly. And there's nothing else like that in any of the other dominions. That said, later on in the war, after the initial wave of, of, of support and volunteers and all of that, there do begin to become... that The Dominion premiers especially start to get a little bit frustrated with Britain, is perhaps a good way of putting it. Of they're, they're, they're annoyed with the progress of the war. The Canadian Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden, famously in a letter that he definitely intended Whitehall to get. He basically rants about, I've got it here, he says, it can hardly be expected that we shall put 400,000 or 500,000 men into the field and willingly accept the position of having no more voice and receiving no more consideration than if we were toy automata. He's very annoyed. This is, this is coming, I think, on the tail end of the Somme. He's very annoyed with the casualty figures he's getting, and he wants to have a say. And he will get his say in 1917, when David Lord George invites the Dominions to Britain to discuss the, the war. Um, and, but that's just, that's purely in the Canadian context. In Australia, there's famously the massive crisis over conscription. All the other Dominions, I think, bring in conscription without a fuss, but because of the local domestic politics at the time, Prime Minister William Hughes doesn't think he can do that. So he calls for a referendum. He thinks he's going to win it. He doesn't. He's narrowly defeated. And it basically, it shatters the Australian Labour Party. And it's, it's one of the defining features of, of Australia's war is, is this complete breakdown of, of, of the unity within the Australian left. And the no voters are explicitly tarred with disloyalty. That's what the government pushes, is that the people who vote against it the, split, the, the ALP are not only disloyal to the British Empire, but they are, back, they are the puppets of a shadowy hunter of, of evil masterminds and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's explicitly based around the idea that they are not being truly loyal to Britain. They are, they are risking Australia's future by their uh, intransigence, and 
Britain needs conscription to to win the war and preserve Australian liberties and all of this kind of stuff. But it doesn't really help. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't help the, the government because they lose the referendum. They have another one the next year. They lose that one too. And all it does is really just divide former political allies into serious camps. It's 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 hard to avoid it living in Britain at the moment. But it is very similar in that way to the Brexit referendum. It it shatters political expectations, the status quo. It's a post-conscription crisis. Australia is very different. So, so when looking at sort of the the political upheaval that happens around that, like, is this, is that one of those political events where it kind of ends up cutting across party lines in some ways and kind of reshapes the entire kind of structure of, of Austri- Australian politics uh, during that period? Oh, absolutely. Basically, what happens is after the conscription referendum uh, goes through, and it's a it's a no vote, narrowly a no vote. Billy Hughes, who's prime minister and who pushed for it, is set to be expelled from his party, and he essentially goes, "You can't fire me. I'm quitting." And he walks out with his loyalists, and he forms a minority government, which no one really expected him to do, because it required him to come to terms with the liberals, who were before this the opposition. So now the former government party is now in opposition, the op- former opposition party is now propping up the government, and it's a very unstable situation. And that's where David Lloyd George's invitation to come to London comes in, and that just that causes chaos, because Billy Hughes wants to go. He loves the spectacle. He sees the advantages of, of going to London and attending the Imperial War Cabinet, which is what it would become. But he can't leave. Australia like this, he'll he'll be on the ocean, he'll be on a ship, and he'll land and find out he's no longer prime minister anymore. Like it, it, it would have been a terrible situation. So he basically he forms a coalition, a national government. It's it's called the National Party uh, with the Liberals, and so we have this complete rearrangement of of Australia's political scene, where a former Australian Labour Party prime minister is now leading a majority of liberal MPs, formerly liberal MPs, and he fights an election on this platform, the platform of win the war, the ALP are all traitors, and they're stopping me going to London and representing Australia, and he sweeps it. He gets a massive majority. And um, even so, even with that, he then tries again with the conscription referendum and is defeated again. So (laughs) Billy Hughes' career is, is incredible. We can learn from that. The Australians were 100% behind winning the war, 100% not behind conscription. Yes. It's, it's <laughs> really, really interesting. It's, it's one of the most studied periods of Australian history, I think. It's, it's very, it's fascinating. The, the idea behind all of that. You can be for the war, and yes, we'll volunteer, but don't make us go. If you make us go, that's tyranny. That's Prussianism. We won't stand for it. But we'll vote for you anyway. It, it's 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 bizarre. It's really really interesting and 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 definitely worth anyone's time to read about. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready to eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons. Any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? 
And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. So, so we've talked a little bit about kind of the experiences in Australia during the First World War. Um, and I think like sort of the legacy of the war in places like, you know, Canada, Australia, New Zealand is, is often kind of well known. Like they're seen as these like this like moment of national sort of creation almost like the, where they're asserting their identities on the international stage. You know, is there anything kind of anything else that we can say about the experiences of other sort of dominion? cultures and nations like you know what were the south africans thinking of, about the war and how did that play into their sort of future after the war ended the south african example is is really interesting because because of their recent history of being at war with britain and yet within less than a generation they're eagerly fighting britain's wars one of the the key members of the imperial war cabinet and the general constitutional progression of the Commonwealth as it becomes is Smuts, who is this uh, former Boer commander who is then basically deputy prime minister and then actual prime minister when, when his superior dies. He is in Britain for most of the last few years of the war, and he joins part of the, the British War Cabinet as a full member, not as a part of the Imperial War Cabinet. He's so trusted by Lloyd George, he is respected by all parties. And yet, when he goes back to South Africa after the war, he's defeated. Um, his, his political rival Herzog takes over. And we see this in quite a few other cases as well. In, in Canada, Borden is dethroned by uh, Mackenzie King, who is also an imperial skeptic too much of a, uh, too much of a leap, but he's less gung-ho about the Empire as Borden maybe is. But there is this trend almost of post-war Dominion politics that is more not wary, again, wary is the wrong word, but more aware of their ties with Britain and perhaps wanting more skepticism in their leaders from it. This is something I I do want to read into more. I want to research more, so I, I'm not claiming that as a as a fact at all, but it's definitely something I want to look at in my thesis. Uh, and I guess you know that kind of thinking about the the path forward for for these for these dominions after the war. When we look at the you know the dominions in the nineteen twenties and kind of the immediate aftermath of of the Paris Peace Conference and, and other things, you know, you see a a continued push for kind of a greater autonomy or at least more definition around their place. And, and I guess you know that would be the kind of expected political outcome of maybe a growing skepticism about existing structures within within the populace even even if it's you know that skepticism is not extreme or or sort of rebellious uh you know wanting clarification and wanting more autonomy would be what i would think would be the outcome of some of those movements i think that's that's really well put i think it does it does seem like that and it's 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 funny you mentioned that wanting more definition is as a as a good thing in a lot of cases it actually was not seen as that it was seen as the the, the british commonwealth we'll just call it that now it becomes more popular as the war goes on and and in the 20s it becomes the almost the official name for it the commonwealth works based on precedent and flexibility and understanding and the fear was from many people that if you as soon as you lay down those rules in black and white on paper it's no longer flexible it can break it from from our perspective perhaps it's this contradictory approach because it's you'd think oh we don't want to be independent from britain so we should naturally want to have our rights laid down almost in a constitution to make it clear what britain can and can't do so we avoid any misunderstandings that might lead to independence 
But that's not the way many contemporaries saw it. They saw it as like, no, 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 you're threatening something that works very well. If it's not broke, don't fix it. But for many people at the time, it was it was broken, as as 1914 had showed. And so one of the things that the Imperial War Conference, which is held in 1917 and then in 1918 as well, one of the things that comes out of that is, is Resolution 9, which Borden and Smuts basically write together. And Resolution 9 declares that the Dominions were autonomous nations of an imperial commonwealth, and they possessed the right to an adequate voice in foreign policy and in foreign relations. Now that is very specifically worded. It doesn't say independent voice, just adequate voice. It doesn't specify mechanisms, it doesn't say the Dominions can make their own foreign policy, it doesn't say that Dominions can have a say in Britain's foreign policy. Just an adequate voice. And that's the key to any diplomatic agreement, basically. Just ambiguity and vagueness. And so we see in, in 1917 and 1918 the Dominions start to actually throw their weight around, almost. Almost by invitation. Lloyd George, when he becomes Prime Minister in, in, at the end of 1916, he does invite the Dominions to come along and discuss the war. They discuss war and peace. And so in 1918, when the conference re-meets, they basically set up peace committees to discuss what they'd like the end of the war to look like, what they're fighting for. And the Dominions outnumber any British statesman on both committees. There's territorial and there's non-territorial, and in both of them, the Dominions basically, I would argue, make their case. And so the committees end with reports basically saying that Australia and New Zealand will keep the Pacific Islands they took from Germany, South Africa will keep the uh, African colonies they took from Germany, and what's interesting is that when Britain goes to Paris after the armistice, and they make their peace terms known, it's almost the same as, as what the Dominions had, had requested, had demanded. They don't get annexation, but it's through the stubbornness, almost, of the Dominion premiers who are there at Paris that instead the mandate system gets mandate class C, I believe, which is essentially annexation in all but name. But it was, it was enough to appease Wilson. But that's another thing that, that needs to be emphasised, is that the idea that the Dominions were at Paris. A lot of contemporary nations were like, hang on, why? Why are the Dominions here as well? Why do the Dominions get a voice, get a vote? They're just part of Britain. They'll do what Britain says. That's unfair. And the Dominions took that as a challenge. We're like, no, 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 we're independent nations. Look at Resolution 9. This is, this is what this is all about. And so the Dominions, they also... In the Council of Four, the Dominions are part of the British panel system. So when Lloyd George isn't available, uh, Robert Borden tended to step in. And as members of the British, pan the British Empire delegation, they had access to documents that other minor nations didn't. So even when the Dominions weren't in the big councils where they're making all the firm decisions, and instead they're talking to Argentina and Peru about peace terms, they have information that the Argentinians and Peruvians don't have because they're part of the British Empire delegation. And we see the Dominions throw their weight around, throw the Empire's weight around at Paris with things like the racial equality clause that the Japanese wanted. I mean, it's fair to say that that had op opponents from outside of the Dominions as well, but I think the most infamous opponent of it is Billy Hughes of Australia, who says things that no, no other diplomat at the table would be willing to say about their ally who sat across the table from them. And he goes on about how it's all horrendously racist and terrible stuff, but he manages to turn a previously fairly neutral attitude of the British round to their side. And I think that's really, I mean, it has massive repercussions because it, really, really ticks off the Japanese, obviously. But it, it, it goes to show to many Australians that, oh, we, we have the voice of the empire behind us now. We can make our case on the international stage. And, and they would continue to do so. It, it is really interesting, kind of the role they play at the Paris Peace Conference, like, and how they get like the same, or as you mentioned, like sometimes even better rights than other, you know, totally independent nations. 
that that are there participating in the discussions. Yeah, I it, it's not it is noticed at the time, and a lot of people, a lot of the other, especially France and the US, are like, no, you you can't stack the the votes in your favor. I I can understand maybe some frustration when somebody shows up to to take a vote and also brings along four friends that they, <laughs> they say also gets a vote. But this is this is the interesting thing is that Lloyd George, he was happy to use the Dominions as as a club to get what he needed to do, and he, he did do so. But I don't think he was fully. I don't think he was a zealot when it came to getting the Dominions at Paris. But the Dominions wore him down, or at least they convinced him of the value of it, and then. Britain, as a as an empire, as a unified voice, managed to then persuade the other allied powers that no, no, the dominions do need to come along. They are not just instruments of British will. They have their own voice, and and they did. But it also, you know, helped Britain quite a bit in some ways. So after the Paris Peace Conference, after sort of all of that gets sorted out during the 1920s, we do see further development of kind of the British Commonwealth and the relationship between all these various units. So can you tell me uh, anything about the, uh, the Balfour Declaration and then the 1926 Imperial Conference? I absolutely can, because I find them absolutely fascinating. Well, we have, after, after the Paris Peace Conference, the next big thing on the Dominion international calendar is the 1921 Imperial Conference. First one, after the war, and the big thing at this, the big international debate, is over the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, which is up for renewal, or at least the, contempor- the people there believe it's up for renewal, it then turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. But what basically happens there is that Britain goes into the conference planning to renew the treaty. Ang- the Japanese were good allies, they protected Britain's interests in the Far East, They kept Australia and New Zealand in the war, allowing them to send troops and supplies and everything else Britain needed. Without that, the German navy might have caused way more damage than it did. And Britain naturally didn't want to throw an ally to the side. Australia and New Zealand were petrified of Japan. Petrified of invasion, both militarily and economically. Militarily, obviously, they're the second or third largest navy in the world, and they're on their doorstep. Economically, again, it's white Australia, white New Zealand, this, this, this racist terror of uh, immigration, of being outcompeted by, different, by lower wages and all that kind of stuff. Whereas, so keeping the alliance keeps them on side, keeps them an ally, keeps them a friend. South Africa is fairly neutral on it. Canada is very much against renewing because Canada has several hundred miles of border with a reason why they don't want to renew. Because America is not happy with the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, because they see it, kind of correctly, as a team against them. Which it was, pretty much. <laughs> Which um, it was, yeah. Yeah. Accurate. And so Canada is naturally a little bit cautious of pissing off the giant military behemoth on their southern border. And what happens is that the Canadians manage to almost win the conference over to their point of view, or at least they drag it out long enough that the Americans then uh, take the rug out from under them by inviting them to the Washington Naval Conference. And that basically, that replaces the treaty with a, uh, with a multilateral alliance, uh, not alliance, uh, agreement on how much, how much of a navy you can build and all that kind of stuff. And that was the end of it. The Dominions were not invited to that. And they didn't seem to expect to go, but they did at least. Uh, they, I, I would argue that they had a very powerful voice at that discussion, where Britain could have easily just abrogated the treaty, moved on with its life, um, and instead listened to what the Dominions had to say. And one Dominion managed to, uh, maybe not overrule, but managed to drag out proceedings and get what it wanted in the end, which was the denunciation of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty. There's some really dramatic irony in a lot of the proceedings, where uh, the Canadians are basically saying, Japan will always be a friend, whether there's a treaty or not. And the Australians are saying, if we insult the Japanese so much as we already have, this is, this is Billy Hughes, by the way, so this is the guy who just a couple of years earlier insulted them to their face. And he's maybe thinking, okay, the alliance stops them 
actually reaching over the table and punching me. So I want to keep that. He's saying things like, if we, if we insult the Japanese, if we insult their honor, that will backfire. And then there's another, the next big event is, is the Chanak crisis, which again is, is a case where the Dominions assert themselves and they throw their weight around and they say to Lloyd George, who is, I won't get into it, but basically there's, he's playing a game of brinkmanship with Ataturk in, in the Republic of Turkey. And he just takes for granted that the Dominions will be on their side if they go to war. And again, I don't want to oversell the Dominion role in it. This was a failure on the international level. He didn't get agreements from France or Italy. But notably, the Canadian Prime Minister, Mackenzie King, in response to a telegram from Churchill saying, please give us troops, he says, hang on, no, 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 no. The Canadian Parliament will decide whether we go to war. And it wasn't a rejection of going to war, but he was reserving the right to Canada for that. And this comes up at the 1923 Imperial Conference. And it's basically decided, yes, we need, we need to sort some stuff out. Because one thing, that was really embarrassing for everyone. That just showed disunity on an imperial front to the entire world. We don't want that to happen again. And so in 1926, as you said, at the Imperial Conference, we have the Balfour Declaration, which comes out of the Committee of Imperi- of the in- Intra-Imperial Relations Committee. And this basically, this is uh, Arthur Balfour. He likes his declarations. He had one in 1917. It's probably more famous than this one, Mm, but I would say this one's just as important in terms of what it means for world affairs. Because the the Balfour Declaration said, they, meaning the Dominions and the UK, are autonomous communities within the British Empire, equal in status, in no way subordinate one to another in any aspect of their domestic or external affairs, though united by a common allegiance to the Crown and freely associated as members of the British Commonwealth of Nations. This is the first time that the unique relationship between Britain and its dominions was actually spelled out in as much detail as this. And there were concerns that, like I said, now it's laid out in stone. Now we know what the terms of this agreement is. What if those terms are broken? They can't just be ignored or brushed under the carpet. But it was a symptom of the times. It had already been clear that the, the current arrangement was no longer acceptable. And it needed to be fleshed out. It needed to be confirmed to avoid Chanak again. I guess like having having a flimsy agreement only looks good and works as long as everybody's kind of on the same page by default or, or you know, by choice. But everybody's working together. Once there are cracks shown, like in the Chanak crisis or Chanak event, um, then any veneer of, oh, yeah, we're just working together. It's all great. We're all friends here kind of starts falling apart, and you do need that increased level of definition. It's, it's very much seen as, as a family. And that's some of the arguments that, that come to mind against the idea of the Balfour Declaration was you don't want to have a... You don't need a document. When you go to have a family gathering for Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever, you don't need an agreement between uncles and nephews and cousins and everyone what the terms of their relationship is. You're a family. You all know it. That's the sentimental aspect of it, and that doesn't quite that doesn't win the day, essentially. Although the idea of the the Commonwealth and the Empire being one big happy family does not go away, that's still very very present. Usually illustrated as lions in a lion's pride, that tends to be the the imperial symbolism. Uh, excellent. So so thank you for for kind of shedding some light on the relationship between you know all of these different disparate parts of the British Commonwealth. Um, obviously, there there's a lot more to say about the evolution of the Commonwealth during the interwar period and going into the Second World War, but I think we should probably save that for an interview on a different podcast that that I know of that that's currently uh, ongoing through the interwar years. Uh, so, so, but thank you so much for joining me here today and uh, you know having a chat uh, about this stuff. Thank you for having Wesley. This has been a lot of fun, and I, as you might be able to tell, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs>